Are we there? to Soul Sisters. We greet you in the matchless name of Jesus. We have with us today our sisters, Pastor uh, Christina Staten, Pastor Cynthia Anderson, Evangelist Blasi Berry, and Pastor Barbara Jackson. We all welcome you today at this special moment on Soul Sisters, and we appreciate you turning into us. We're going to now ask Evangelist Berry to lead us in prayer. Father God, in your precious name, we thank you for this day. We thank you, the Heavenly Father, for life that you've given us. Father, we don't take it for granted. But Father, as we go into this session, we ask you, the Heavenly Father, to be with us. We ask you to grant us wisdom. We ask you to bless those that come on board to hear what thus saith the Lord. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to allow us to impart wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through all that we say and we do. God, we turn this over to you, and we give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. Thank you. So how is everybody doing today? Wonderful. Oh, Wonderful. Yeah. Are we shrinking in this heat or what? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's <laughs> finally getting heat. <laughs> what oh, yeah. did you say? New York is finally getting heat. Yes, yeah. we finally got heat. Yes, we finally We're got heat. We're getting heat that needs central air. And guess uh, what? Yes. And guess what, ladies? I came home and laid down and I woke up to a sultry hot house they cut the air condition off so the hawk was coming out in me so bear with me i was trying to cool off i got two big old fans around me yeah 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 i'm trying not to complain you know because we live in the great northeast and we have more snow than we have heat but it's yeah. hard you know this hair is suffering <laughs> any current affairs news that we want to share well as y'all experiencing and enjoying all the heat here in florida our numbers are all the same um and it seems like our, our governor is really 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 downplaying it which is very um i have very great concerns about that um dangerous yeah he's really downplaying it if that these are numbers that um, that people's walking around with the virus didn't know they had it, and because they was doing testing and people come back to work, and that was the reason why the numbers were escalating. So he um, did a press conference today, and that was what he alluded that the numbers is not as bad as it seems. Um, but if you turn to other media platforms, they're saying that the numbers and it's a possibility that Florida would be another epic center like New York. Yeah. Well, needless to say, Henry and I, my husband, we made a decision. We're not going anywhere. I don't care no. what the saying. So, yeah. Yeah, I heard many of the, uh, many of unfortunately the red states, the one that ones that was forcing the opening, many of those. I know Texas, Arizona, um, uh, Florida, yeah, State, Florida. Florida. You know, many of those are the states that are now seeing um, the increase in numbers. Where New York, our, our, we went, we flatlined almost. Um, yeah, yeah. There really haven't been a large amount of cases, and even with the protests in the streets and stuff like that, our numbers really haven't increased. 
least, and I think it has been like two weeks or more, um, that they were fearful that the numbers would go up. But it seems like, um, you know, I'm knocking on wood, uh, that uh, is still, I think because the way our, our governor handled it from the very beginning and kind of squashed it and, and you know, kind of, um, uh, what was the word, solidified, like, you know, everybody stay in, do this. So now even though people get out because they weren't exposed to it, and even though we're walking next to each other and things like that, it's not spreading it because it was really contained in the very beginning. Yeah, yeah he did the litigation, he made sure. And I think because there was such an alarm sounded here in New York State, that um, because our governor took such a serious approach uh, to the pandemic, I think that we saw a lot more of our community following the rules. And, you know, so as a New Yorker, when we turn on television, it's like really like, oh my goodness, to look at other states and see them coming together for pool parties and picnics and doing all these things. and. Um, and that was um, even before the states begin to open up, they yeah. were still doing these things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I, I'm grateful that we, we are in a state where there's a consciousness. You know, not everybody in our state follows the rules, but a lot of people, they have a consciousness about this and they have really stuck to um, those things that our, our governor has laid out for us. So that's really helped us uh, flatten this curve. Yeah, I agree. I, I absolutely agree. And again, you know, I don't agree with everything with Cuomo politics, but I can say in a lot of things, he has stepped to the plate and he has shown himself yeah. an excellent leader in a yeah. uh, crunch and in, 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 yeah. in through the storm. So I give him kudos on uh, what he's doing, even with um, June, June, um, Juneteenth, you know. I know. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was like, you know what? It's a state holiday, you know? I love that. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it was unexpected. I was like, ah! you know? <laughs> ah, it's it's wow. funny because a lot of companies went in on that, mm -hmm. um, which was also awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. So a lot of companies stepped into up to the plate and mm -hmm. they were like, we're giving our, our our employees off. Even my company did that. So it was considered a company holiday, Juneteenth. Can you imagine that? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and then of course the mayor jumping in and doing the same thing, making it, working on making it a city holiday. So right. I lot, love it. Yeah, isn't that something? Who would have ever thought, yeah. um, you know, that we would be here, uh, yeah. which is a great place, but you know, who would have thought? Uh, but yeah, a lot of them are now there, you know, and then other things that are happening out of that Juneteenth, you got organizations that are giving now to the social, those those racial and social injustice uh, organizations that fight against racial and social injustice. Um, I think Netflix uh, gave 100, I believe it was $120 million to Black yeah. College. Awesome. So, yeah, it, it's a lot of um, companies, people, organizations are stepping up to the oh. plate, um, mm -hmm. you know, to do the right thing during this time. And you know, when we when we look at that, um, I'm I'm really uh, enthusiastic about what we see happening. We see uh, statues being removed. We see pancake boxes and syrup oh, no. containers being changed. Yes. But yes. I also think that we have to be careful as African Americans not to allow America to just throw us a bone. Because we know that if we really want to see change, it comes in education. Yeah. And, um, you know, the big thing is, you know, when they pass same sex marriage, um, immediately after that bill was passed for same sex marriage right here in New York State, immediately yes. they went to work on our textbooks in schools. They started altering textbooks from yes. rewriting yes. curriculums from kindergarten to 12th grade, changing the dynamics of what marriage looks like, what a traditional family looks like. And so, you know, we celebrate uh, these things that we're seeing, but really true change will never come without education. And yes. we need to now yes. begin to force, forget about Aunt Jemima, forget about Quaker and Uncle Ben's. I yes. want to see you rewrite that educational curriculum. I yes. want to see people in our curriculum that look like us. I want to see a, do, a true depiction in our education curriculum of what of the plight of the black man and what we yeah. have suffered and what we yeah. have contributed contributed to this country because until you know we begin to educate in the school system there can be no empathy so Absolutely. our kids are still going to go to go to school with other white children who don't 
understand about black people. And that understanding cannot come without education. So I I celebrate these small changes, but I just, you know, I'm tired of America throwing black people a bone and we just gnaw on it and celebrate. These these little changes, you know, we need big changes and those changes come in our education system. Yes. Uh, Grace, Grace, can you share with everybody a little bit what you share with me today concerning Juneteenth? You said something that was really powerful. Um, I can't remember exactly what I said because you know I talk so much. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I was sharing kind of what I shared with my cousins and nieces and nephews. They were over yesterday and we did eat and have a celebration type thing. And um, I just kind of gave them a brief history um, of the struggle and things that was going on because the reason, like Pastor Christina and many of you already said, is miseducation. And you know, I kind of relate to them how we tell our kids that part truth is still alive. You know, you know how you tell part of truth and you say, well, I told part the truth, but it's still a lie. So in our educational system right now, they talk about Columbus, they talk about Martin Luther King, they talk about slavery, but they really don't give the background of it. And um, and so it's a disadvantage, like Pastor Christina said, it's a disadvantage not only to our black children, African-American children and other communities that are now in our education system, but it's a disadvantage to our white communities right. because they don't understand the anger that we're going through and why we yeah. feel the way we feel. Right. And so they said, you know, it's about slavery, but it's not just about slavery. It's about after slavery end, you know, they we were in a place where your mother and father put you out of the house and didn't give you any keys, didn't give you no food, no bread. You have no access to jobs. So we were at an economic disadvantage. Right. Okay? right. And so by just throwing us out, but you know, okay, they're free. That's it. So we took our clothes. Some of us couldn't even take the clothes that were provided that was provided for us. And so you know. We, we had to walk the streets and get jobs. We were blackballed, couldn't um, uh, we couldn't work a certain specific job. And so then we found ourselves working for pennies on a dollar. You see, yes. so it was another yes. form of slavery. And so yes. we, they, then they say, you know, why can't black people get ahead? It's because once we were free, the South was so mad that they, they're anger because they wasn't getting free labor. And, and this is another thing we say free labor. What is free labor? The, the point of the fact is we if we built your city, if we if we tilled yeah, your yeah. land and you got commerce for it, that means yeah. that you made money to put in your environment and not only build your houses, to build your societies and build the government. And so yeah. really the, the uh, labor of the uh, African-American slaves built the country in that it was free labor, even up in the North, you got to understand that the North supplied the South with product. And so how was mm-hmm. the South able to um, buy product from the North? Through free labor. And another yeah. thing I, I explained to him, I try to, and I hate because, you know, I can go on and on. You know, different people have got restoration. You know, the Jews yes. got restoration. Yes. Chinese that was in America at the time during the war that was sanctioned um, wrongly, they got restoration. The Indians get free education. They yes. got land. Yes. They, get, they get loans and stuff. They, they got restoration. But after slavery, we were supposed to get a mule and so many acres of land. Yes. No, we did not get that. Yes. So that, that put us at advantage of not being able to get jobs, not being able to feed our family, not being able to buy homes, not being able to buy cars. And so where did that land us? You see what I'm understanding? And so the, what I said, you create an environment that people uh, people are doing whatever they can do to survive. And so then you stand back and say, well, look at them. Look how they're hustling. Look at their thieves. Look what they do. You created that environment by bringing us here against our will, forcing us to work um, without recompensation, and then barring us from anything that we can do. You know, from from over, you, you know what they did to Black Wall Street and stuff like that. And so, you know, yeah. all of these is, should be in our package in our education system so white Indian Chinese Guyanese all can understand what happened to the African Americans here yeah. in America and why yeah. and, and really the police system and I'm gonna stop right here the police system was a form to connect back to free will labor because if you know about um, the prison system the prison system the prisoners they work for the pennies on the dollar yeah. so it's another yeah. form of slavery and so they instituted the police system to uh, get 
um, you know, put people back into jail system and things like that. So they again, the chain, remember the chain gangs? I don't know if you remember yeah. the chain gangs. It was for free, you know? And so with Juneteenth, Juneteenth I think everybody now understands is that it took a long time for the message of freedom to come through uh, the pipeline. They didn't have internet and stuff at that time. And so although it ended the end in uh, maybe November, the South didn't get it to maybe January 1st. And that's why many of us celebrate um, a, 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 a service on January watch night, African-American right. South, celebrate that. And people don't understand we celebrate it because we were waiting to hear whether we was free. Okay. Right, and so right. that happened in, um, for, for January 1st. But Texas, look how far, far Florida is from Texas. And so they didn't get it until, you know, June sometime, yeah. you know, it passed down the line. And so that's why we celebrate because, you know, we can't celebrate when we found out when we were free in New York or in Baltimore. And Vienna, but because if, I, if my brother's still bound, I'm still bound, bound right? Yeah. So yeah. we celebrate June, June 15th because that's when kind of everybody understood that freedom was there, you know, and freedom was here for everybody. And so, Again, be free in the body, but still be strained uh, and, and condemned, you know, that can't can't make a living for oneself. That's still not justice. Right. right. That's what C was saying. That's why education is essential, because if they're not yeah. educated, then they're they're free and not able to make money for their family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's it's our, they our are whole inventions away from us as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our grandchildren, we have another generation that is coming up and they're looking for us to set things in order that they will see change. They yeah. should not have to come after us and fight for change. We are here. We are, we're in it. So we have to hit the floor and make things happen. See changes from state to state. We have to, like Pastor Christina said, why settle for a bone? That's nothing. Our, our, my grandchildren, I've got eight now, I think. <laughs> and she proud of all eight too. <laughs> I got one more coming. Uh, yeah, I got one more little girl coming. I can't wait. But for the sake of my grandchildren, Pastor Christina, you have grand. Yes. Pastor Barbara, you have grand. Um, I don't think you have great grand grace and, and flossy, but no. they're coming. They're coming, right? Yeah. Why not let them come in and see the work that their grandparents did? Right. Not right. come to the family reunion to Thanksgiving and hear us complaining about what's going across the news screen. And mm -hmm. we didn't make a difference. We right. are here to make a difference from city to city, from state to state, have to get out. I don't want to always get out. Mm -hmm. I don't want to always have to, you know, rally the troops. Come on, let's mm -hmm. go make some noise. But whoever it takes, you know, the song said, mm -hmm. I'm all in, whatever it yeah. takes. Yeah. 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 We yeah. have to be I felt yeah. that. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, whatever it takes we I'm have to grab our, yeah, grab our churches. We, we have, have to do the work. We, we have, have to do the work. Caucasian we have to do the work. We have to do the work. our Caucasian connections. Yeah. And let's work this thing. Mm -hmm. Let yeah. them hear us. Mm -hmm. Let them feel us. What we yeah. have experienced. Some don't mm -hmm. know. They, they don't. only know what their grandparents told them. Mm -hmm. They're only riding on what they were taught. Mm -hmm. And they don't know. But mm -hmm. the more I ride through my neighborhood and I see the signs saying Black Lives Matter, that that is that's that's kudos for me. I'm excited right. because yeah. somebody's yeah. making a difference, right? Yeah. Somebody's because standing we, we out. Need to put, we need to put some of those signs in our own neighborhoods and remind our own black brothers that's that black true. lives matter. Yeah. Because here in Albany, just in the last week, we've had 14 shootings in Albany in the last week of black on black crazy. crime. And wow. so while we're out saying black lives matter. We need to change the mentality and make sure we're changing the I narrative know. and I that know. our community understand wow. that black lives matter. Because Absolutely. if our black lives don't matter to us, then why are they trying to put them to matter to somebody else? I know. I know. You know, they're going in New York. Um, in New York, they actually, they're putting murals of black lives matter 
in all five boroughs. So mm -hmm. you will find one in Lower Manhattan. You will find one in Queens, you, Jamaica, Queens. Mm -hmm. You will find one in Staten Island, the Bronx, and I mean, in Brooklyn, of course. So they're putting the mural Black Lives Matters on the streets mm -hmm. in all five boroughs. Yeah, yeah, because we have to start taking a participant. Yes, you know, our government and our Congress and things like that, they're making steps. We also have to make steps in home. Um, and yeah, that that's something I'm trying to figure out myself. I was just thinking today, what can we do, you know, to change and turn things around also in our neighborhood for them to see that this is a pivotal moment and to stop turning guns on ourselves and, yeah. and start being proactive in other different ways um, in order for our community community to be better. Um, and, you know, it's really difficult to really try to figure out what to do, Grace. You know, we're all educated. We have all done programs and different things, but it's really, it's a hard nut to crack because when I was growing up, even though I had a single parent, she was an involved single parent. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with a generation whose parents yeah. are not active participants. Yeah. And so you, you understand what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. they're not active participants. And you know, you know, I know people right now that don't even wake their children up to go to school. If their kids stay in sleep in school, it doesn't even matter to them. So I we're know, crying I out, know. give us more programs, defund the police and give us more programs. Listen, I'm tired of receiving child support from the government. It come a point in time where we have to take responsibility and it's difficult with this generation because we're dealing with parents that don't want to participate in progress so it's hard when you know you're dealing listen i've got so many teachers in my church and and their stories almost make you want to cry because they're working in these community schools on purpose yeah and just hear them say that when the kids come in they're getting cussed out by a five-year-old cussed out by a six-year-old you know, coming to school and being, you're a teacher and you're trying to educate. And then if they say something now, the parent is not going to come to the PTA. The parent is not going to get up out of bed and make sure that the kids are doing their homework. But let them talk about making the kids wear uniforms. And now the parents want to come show up mm -hmm. because they want their kids to be fashionable. You know, it's like, we're going to mm -hmm. get up and make sure you get to wear Jordans, but we're not going to wake up and make sure that you get yes, your Yes, yes. So, you know, it's it's almost like six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. It's a tough nut to crack. No. Yeah. But you know, you know, I got to keep saying there's hope because who would knew that we would be in the situation that we're in now, you know, right. in the right. struggle. So something got to break over here too, you know. Yeah. You know, you know. Can I say I mean, Lord to give it to y'all so y'all so will have it. <laughs> Change <laughs> is one village to, to raise a nation. It's going to take a village. Um, yeah, just yeah, yeah, yeah. Grassroots, so grassroots connection. Yeah, it's going to take other folks coming aboard, organizations. It's going to take the church, especially the church. I mean, I think this is a pivotal time for the church to get more involved in the community and to grab hold of the youth and those that are needed to single parent home, whatever it is. This is now, this is the time for us to extend the hand and to really show the love of Christ through all that we can do to help build up the community. Yeah, yeah. It's a struggle. It's a struggle because even with the church, you know, and I don't want to go back and forth, but even with the church, you know, the disrespect with the children and the parents are still there. You know, back in the day, you know, the bishop or the elder or, the, or even the elderly in the church spoke to the parent about the child and or even spoke to the child and, and the connection would be there. But now if you don't bring your child to church, you don't send them to school properly, you don't definitely don't bring them to church, then they don't have a respect for that elderly leadership. You understand what I'm saying? And so even though we go out, we go out in the field and we hand out food and we hand out, but, you know, we, we try to make the connections, but not all the time is it received. They want whatever, whatever we have to give, but they don't want anything else. You see what I'm saying? Um, so it, it is, it is, it is a line and I'm, I'm not giving up hope. Like I said, keep hope alive. Keep, Jesse hope alive. <laughs> keep hope alive. You know, but we have an excellent speaker with us today. We don't want to prolong it, but we have an excellent, excellent speaker here today. An awesome woman of God. Um, I really uh, appreciate her coming on with us today. 
um, my experience of, um, and it was really through um, Heal Me Now, um, that I understood the pain of um, children uh, or victims that have experienced uh, child molestation. Um, I knew about it, I heard about it and stuff like that, but it was really in going into those sessions and having people share their stories about, um, you know, the pain that they still live with uh, because of what happened to them, you know? And I really think that, you know, more churches and, and it's this is not just in the church. I don't want to say this is a church thing now, but I wish um, more churches, yes, would be proactive. And that's what I'm thinking of that proactive in establishing a system to look out for the signs to protect their children. And then if something does happen to make the right choices and do the right thing up front so people don't carry the burden of possibly they were at fault because no one that is a victim should ever feel yes, like they're yes, at fault. Yes, and yes. so she's awesome. She brought it out excellent with everything I've heard of her and, and, and we've seen her a couple years and I fellowship, we fellowship with her many a times. Um, Pastor um, uh, Cynthia Anderson brought her to the platform so I'm going to allow her the opportunity to introduce her. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Grace. I want to uh, read this bio. Safe Walls Initiative, uh, Pastor Teresa Burton is the founder and the senior facilitator. Safe Walls Initiative is a movement aimed to work together with churches, youth programs, and agencies to prevent child sexual abuse. We bring awareness to provide effective training to pastors, to youth leaders, to youth workers and volunteers. Our assignment is to reduce the risk within the walls. Hundreds of churches and programs have been sued because a minor subjected, minor subjected to sexual molestation by church workers, by church members, by church leaders, volunteers, and by other children. Unfortunately, some leaders ignore these concerns and fail to implement a prevention program they think no child has ever been molested in the walls of my church, so why should I worry? This attitude of denial is very dangerous. The lack of prevention programs leaves the children, the church and the church leaders very vulnerable. Safe Walls has taken moderately simple yet effective steps that will significantly reduce the likelihood of child sexual abuse. This training is to alert you to the seriousness of the risk, but more importantly, provide help so that we can reduce the possibility of such incidents from ever occurring. Now, this is the time to join hands as we take these positive steps to make churches a safe place for our children within our walls. Child abuse, whether emotional, verbal, neglectful, physical, or sexual. It's something we all pr pray against. We pray against it. We seek God to protect our homes, our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, and our city. The Bible, the Bible states we perish due to lack of knowledge. As we seek more knowledge, we as Christians can pray more effectively and have more information on how to fight against the device of the enemy. Safe walls is just that. Questions that we will deal with that you should consider. What are some behavioral signs for children? What are some emotional signs for children? What are some key points of prevention with homes, with churches, social programs? The real big question is, why are the numbers for child sexual abuse increasing? Why are the people still blind to child sexual abuse? It is my honor, a humble privilege, to introduce this song and 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 to to uh, just present to others my dear sister, Pastor Teresa Burton, all the way from Jacksonville, Florida. Why don't you just clap your hands? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We welcome you to Soul Sisters. Hello, Soul Sisters. Yes. I'm welcome. To you guys. I'm, welcome. I was listening. I'm like, I'm, I'm over here talking to myself. <laughs> I'm like, I want to join this conversation. I'm a cool sister. Okay. 
But I'm excited to be here tonight. I'm really excited to be here tonight. So we're giving you the floor at this time to share with us. <laughs> okay, share, share, share. Okay, well, as she already read, I wasn't expecting her to read all that, but amen, praise God. But Safe Wall was um, birthed out of pain. It was birthed out of, I believe, in taking your pain, making it to purpose, taking your mess and turning it into a message. And that's what this is all about. So um, and some of you may know my testimony for the ones that do not. I've been raped, male, I've been raped 12 times by male and female since the age of five years old. And so, and I was going to church, baby. I didn't miss church. They took me to church. I went to school. I was in summer camp program. I was in school bleeding and nobody recognized the abuse that I was dealing with until it was really too late. The abuse already occurred. And so um, Safe Wall Initiative was birthed out of trying to educate and bring awareness, not only just to our church, but to our community. There's a reason yes. that the numbers are still increasing with all the testimonies, with all people, all the um, African Americans, Caucasians, we share our testimony, we tell our children, yes. but somehow the, the numbers are still increasing. And there's a reason for that. Now there's a lot of dynamics to make that up, but I truly believe that we're still blind to the fact that stranger danger is no longer exists. That don't exist anymore. Come it's, on. It's, it's family danger. Yes. It's, yes. Danger. it's yes. my best friend danger. It's my son friend danger. It's my daughter's friend's danger. Yes. It's the babysitter danger. It's not stranger danger. We're looking for strangers to hurt our kids, mm -hmm. but it's people that we Amen. know. Amen. It's people that literally have a problem and we love them. And just because we love them, that don't mean their problem is going to go away. So mm -hmm. Safe Wall Initiative was birthed out of that. And I'm, I'm so excited. I get opportunity to go into churches, um, summer camp programs, youth programs, provide the training. Um, I train to come with material. I train to come up with uh, work, uh, work sheets. It comes with, because I believe in um, not only telling you the problem, but let's get some solutions. Yeah. Amen. Now, this. Safe Wall does not eliminate child sexual abuse, but it reduced the risk. It mm -hmm. reduced the risk. If you provide prevention, awareness and prevention programs and intervention programs, I truly believe we'll see the numbers. I believe that we just need more, more of us need to come together and make sure it happens. Mm -hmm. Now, listen, this this is a very specific subject. People don't want to talk about stuff like that. And I get right. it. Mm -hmm. I get it. It brings up scars. It brings up. I remember when I first, whoo, Father God, when I first God released me to share my story. And I will I will be honest with you, I left out the pulpit like, okay, what did I just do? Like, did I just tell my story? <laughs> did I just tell everything? Oh Lord Jesus. Now keep in mind, I ain't told everything because a fool altered his old mind. So I don't okay, <laughs> <thank God. laughs> ain't gonna happen, partner. Right. <laughs> I love it. Ain't gonna happen. Ain't okay. gonna happen. <laughs> but my point of saying that is when I first initially start off, and I actually uh I have a mentoring gr group also um called um Proverbs 31 and Project AIM. And so I teach my uh mentees how to share their testimony not only just in a safe environment but it's um you know make sure you you protect your family too because at the end of the day that's still your family at the end of the day that's still your dad that's still mm -hmm. your mom that's still your sister and that's still your children's father so you have to know how to tell your testimony so therefore your children don't have to fight the battle oh you're talking about my dad you're talking about my auntie and stuff like that so i teach people how to do that without going ham amen okay so, um, with that being said, with Safe Wall Initiative, I truly believe that, um, like I said, the numbers are increasing. And that's one of the greatest sensitive and most vulnerable questions that I go in when I go in training is talking about why are the numbers are increasing. And majority of the times we come up with all different kind of answer, but it's really this, it, this one, it's really one answer. We don't want to deal with it. We right. Right. We don't, right. Right. We don't right. want, we don't want to watch this. And I hate to say it this way. We don't want to see our children and say, you know what? He's in he's inappropriate with my daughter. Right. We don't want to address that stuff. So we're always looking for the outside, but what about the inside? What about right. the that you raised up with? That's your mama's brother. We don't want to deal with that kind of stuff, and we wonder why the victims is our keep occurring. So that's my introduction with all that. Y'all can ask me questions. Um, is there anything that you want me to share? Um, uh, I'm I'm prepared to answer questions. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> 
Right. Okay. Well, for me, okay, for me, um, I definitely want you to show us signs that we can look for that possibly uh, a child may be um, an abusive situation. And I just want to add on that, you know, it's still the ugly thing in a closet. You know, back in the day, um, you know how women had children out of wedlock and nobody said anything and they, they went down south for nine months and came back with a nephew or something like that and a mother raised it. You know, we got over that stigmatization and now people just having kids all out of wedlock, you know, I'm not saying right or wrong, but I said, you know, a lot of with everything, we talk about depression, we might talk about, you know, um, uh, different things in our society, but still, it's, it's strange to me why um, molestation and, and physical abuse is still not spoken about, yet it's so prevalent, and, and the thing about it is, I think it's still that ugly thing in the closet that, you know, by me saying that my daughter was abused, or I was abused, or, 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 or putting it out out there it makes us feel and i'm just saying whoever might be in a situation this is what i'm thinking make us feel that we didn't do our job and we don't want to expose yeah. the people that we yeah. did not do our job let me stop yeah. right there You're absolutely right um not only i'm a victim of child sexual abuse i also work for the child protection services and you'll be you'll be amazed when we had kids come through our program what the mom would say is this my fault is this my fault what did i did not do so they don't want to bring awareness and some of it, let's be real, and I got to be transparent, some of it is not their fault, but they were blind to what they were doing. They brought in the boyfriend too soon, spending night overnight. Um, you're not paying attention to your son's friend. You're not getting up in the middle of the night and not paying attention and making sure that everybody's sleeping in the proper places. You're not paying attention when your kids all come together and do a sleepover. We are blind to the fact, and we think our babies are so innocent, which they are, but they're curious. Listen, yeah, I have cases, yeah. I have cases where um, children will have sleepovers, right? And the mom would be so blind to, and she would go to sleep. Young boy, young Billy, six years old, will go have all sex on seven year old. And it's not because somebody touched him, it's because he have an old teenage a brother that's in the house and she, he, or she saw them do that act with somebody else. So now they bring it to their friends. So when you, when you don't address these type of issues and you don't think about the possibility, you are not the only person that have influence over your child. Other children have influence over your child. The school teacher have influence over your child. But if you do not educate yourself enough, and you know, one thing I did with my kids when they was coming up, they could not play in the room by themselves. No, I'm sorry. All the kids come out into the living room. We don't play tent. We're not playing tent. If we're gonna play a tent house, I'm gonna be under there with you, baby girl. Mm -hmm. I'm going under that. I'm gonna be hot and everything with the hot flashes. But I'm going to that tent with you. you know, <laughs> amen, you amen, you know, you know, amen. You know, we don't take the. We don't take baths with each other. <laughs> Uh -uh, right, no. but you got some of the people are still carrying on. Watch this. I had a client, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it was a very sad situation. I had a client that she found her son, her 14 year old son, was um, having his three year old sister have all sex on him. And I told them, I said, You know, I believe that brothers and sisters love their baby brother, baby brother, and baby sister, but when they are curious already and they got they're addicted to pornography. They're going to look at their sisters and brothers as another person. They're not going to look at them as a sister and brother. They see the, the, the hormone going on the way is all out of control. And once you see that person naked, you take your little sister to the bathroom, the very same thing that you watch on the TV, your sister have. What's going to separate them? And um, this happens all the time. And another reason why, um, I want to answer your question, another reason why that we're saying that why is this subject with everything else has been talked about, why this stuff is so sensitive is because it's about the people that we love. Yes. At the end of the day. Somebody just, had a question. Yes, go ahead. CJ Jackson had a question. She said, what if a child confides that they have been touched? Is that something to keep confidential or should a parent be told? Yes, a parent should be told and then you should allow, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer two ways. A parent should be told automatically because keep in mind is, although you may not be sanctioned by the government by being with, if that's an adult, 
you have an obligation to let someone know that a child has been harmed. So, and there is a there is a crime in when you know of a child being abused and don't say anything. That is a crime. That is a crime. So let me go back to the other thing is I have done this myself, even as a pastor. I would give that parent the ability to stop the handling. But after so many days, after and I'm gonna follow up with you, and you have not handled your business. I'm sorry, JSO, I'm calling. I'm calling JSO. That's our um department here. But what I'm saying, and the reason why we gotta do that, sometimes we can't, we're so we're so cautious of risk, risk we are so cautious in protecting the person feeling and to the yeah. child at, at the yeah. of the right. building. Let me tell we, you. And we, we we protect it at the expense. And that's what I was saying when you first came on. And I said that that's kind of what I kind of understood. It healed me now that uh, we protect it at the child expense. We don't know the damage that we're doing to the child by protecting the brother, the uncle, the pastor, the friend. You know, Absolutely. they're thinking they're a child that they're going to get over it. But they grow up and they have they deal with these issues like you know how they relate to men how they relate to women how they build relationships how how they respect elderly you know all of these things are going by because we not only handle not only handle the situation we don't get them the help that they need in order to heal themselves from the inside so they grow up in a broken situation yeah let me let me, let me say some statement about this it says parents are doing things in front of their children they are doing things in front of their children and they're unfortunate um children get serious and they'll repeat that but the other problem is that i see in the not just in the church but just how parents handle things when you find a child that says they've been abused they have been touched we automatically go to the person that they're accusing and we confront that person that person in front of the child what do you think that child is going to do they're going to back up what they say it because now you're yeah. forcing them to deal with the predator in front of them that's inappropriate, totally inappropriate. Mm -hmm. So then we have these children that change their mind or change their stories, all because they feel pressure. If it's your, yeah. if it's my, if it was my mother's brother, who wants to go and tell my mom your brother touched me? Right. My mom loved her brother. So if you confront your brother in front of me, yes, I'm gonna back up and I'm say, no, that's not what I said. I, I didn't say that. Um, um, I was talking about somebody else. All because now you can crush it. But you have so many things that, um, and that's what Safe Wall does. Safe Wall, Safe Wall actually provides not only churches and, and a nonprofit organization, but families how to deal with it, how to talk to your child to see if something going on. Because there is, you can have a conversation with your child, but if you if you lead the conversation with, well, did they touch you? Name a name. Now you lead it to a person, and so now your testimony is going to be thrown out in court. Because you led that conversation, and you start mm -hmm. name dropping. So now your now your um, whole case is out, is thrown out of court. So, so can you so, can you give us some procedures of how we should deal with it as parents, as elders? You know, if somebody comes to me today and say, you know, First Lady Grace, you know, this has been happening in my home. What should I do? What should be the first thing I should do? Can well, I ask yeah. her to deal with two things with that one question? Yes. Go so ahead. she said pastor. I mean, she said leader and parent. So in there, can you tell what does a pastor do if the person is a friend to you? How do you handle that? The person, the predator is a friend of yours. I think pastors really want to know how do I handle when it comes to me as a superior? And okay, the person. So you're asking if a pastor's friend come at say something? No, if a, the friend is the abuser. Okay, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Well, first and foremost, let me deal with uh what Lady Grace just asked me. So Lady Grace, you just asked me as a pastor, if a member was to come and say, Hey, someone touched my child, there's several things that's gonna have to the question that I ask. Now I I claim that my training is you don't ask a certain detail, that's certain good questions questions you don't ask because you're not an investigator your job is never to be an investigator never so you don't start investigating all this kind of stuff you first ask is, is the child is out of harm that's the first thing number two is the child it didn't happen on the grounds of the church 
when, did it happen at someone's house? When you start asking these type of questions, based on how they answer, it determines what the next step. So it depends on how they answer that, they're based on the next step. Now, one of the things I train with churches is, churches need to say, they need to create a prevention team. Some of this stuff should never get to the pastor. It mm-hmm. should never get to the pastor. There should be a prevention team that has been created in the church where if a child, now keep in mind if, if a person goes directly to the pastor, that's something totally different. But if this child is in your youth program and you start talking to a child or they're talking to another adult and they expose that something happened at the church or that something happened at the house, there should be a protocol procedure that's taking place that that, that work, worker or that pastor or that leader should follow. And when it follows those steps, so my training actually provides that step and what it needs to follow. But it really depends on how that person answer that question. Well, I can give you this up. Somebody gonna have to be called. Somebody have to be called. First and foremost, if the if the parent is not the one that's disclosing this this problem, and it's another adult coming to you, you have to call that parent. And then after that call phone call of the parent, then you have to call um, the legal authority. Because guess what? If you don't pro- properly address these issues, you're putting your church and those who that child told in a position where they can not only get sued, they got to spend time in jail. So what if what if it didn't happen at the church, but the person felt comfortable to come and tell the pastor? Still, okay. the pastor is obligated to tell the authorities. Yeah, it's it, they they are obligated. They're still obligated to tell even pastor. Let's say hypothetically, this child said this is two years ago. They're still obligated to say something. Now, when they make that phone call, they will make it very clear that if this child has confessed or this child has actually disclosed this happened two years ago. But keep in mind is the problem is if they don't if they don't say anything, you're running the risk this person that abused that child is abusing another child. Yes, yeah. And yeah. This time they stop doing that to that child does not mean they have stopped the abuse. They just stop with that child. So that is the reason why we're mandated to say something because just because there's one victim coming to you, majority of the time, where there's one, there is two. Yes, yes. Two, there are four. Yes. So you have to make sure, and, and this is like I said, again, this is very simple. We don't want to see none of our sisters and brothers go to jail. However, right. they need to be fixed. There is a problem there. Right. And until we keep, until we constantly trying to solve all of it, we can't not solve it. That's not something we can solve. We can just go in prayer. I do believe in prayer. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me twisted. But when there is child has been abused, we can't not use prayer as a weapon to protect this child at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Prayer needs to be a part of the problem, but it can't be the solution. Right. Okay. And, and, and we have a couple of questions here. Let me see. Can we get any? Let me see what the questions. What if a parent doesn't believe the child? We have that here. Um, okay. I think that's the question. The last one. What if what if um, a parent doesn't believe the child? I, I don't know how, whether you can answer that or not. Um, well, there's several things. There's several, I have had cases like that too. So, um, I just want to say, it's believable. I just had a case like that maybe three, four months ago. Um, the parent didn't believe the child because the child had a, 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 a history of lying. Okay. And that may be true, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. Most children, I'm being honest with you, I only had two cases and I worked for the partner only 10 years. And the two years I've been working for the department, I only had two cases that came back home. Mm-hmm. That is a that's a very low percentage. Yeah. With the amount of cases I have. So now am I saying the kids lie? Yes, I am saying that kids can lie. But normally they they're not lying. Now, when you say with teenagers, if a teenager have this fluctuation with adults, and an adult do not act on that. I have seen what teenagers make up for because they wanted that man, they wanted that girl, that lady, and they did not bid, bid on it, and they make up a lot. So I have seen that happen. However, far and few, there's far and few of those stories. So even if you go to a case where a child says something and um, it, 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 this child known to be a liar or lied in the past, 
me personally, and not just how I train, a rather be safe than sorry. And if you really believe this child is telling the story, now you can do, do your investigation. Like then try to go get this child counseling and let the counselor know and say, hey, do, diligence. do your due diligence. Absolutely. Tell the counselor, okay, I'm, she have a, a history of lying. She gave a story to me. I'm not sure if it's true or not. Before I actually open this can of worms, I'm just trying to figure out is everything okay with my daughter. But at no given time that you tell the child that you believe they're lying. Because at that point, at that point, you just damage the child. When you tell the child that you don't believe them, you know you're a liar anyway. How can anybody ever believe That's you? That's not good. Yeah. yeah. And another another thing I picked up again from John Gallagher, I'm now him and now all the props tonight. So uh <laughs> another thing that I picked up is um even with the parent knowing, say if it's an uncle or, or or aunt for that matter, and the parent know and you know it's been exposed in the family, sometimes the parent um, still allows, or the family still allows the uncle or the aunt to come to the uh, come to the uh, Thanksgiving, come to Christmas, and I, I don't think they're doing it on purpose. But you know, it, it has been expressed that you're making me visit my tormentor on all these holidays. So it's a holiday for everybody in the family, right? But for yeah. me, I have to see Uncle John again. You know, for me, I have to see Aunt Mary again, and so I'm, I'm tormented inside because you know this big. Family thing, and I have to face my tormentor, or, or you know, my you know. Now that right there, that has a lot to do with the family dynamic. And I always tell families, you know, when you have something like this, especially somebody that's real close in the family, you need to go ask them and have a talk, have a conversation, and mm -hmm. how it's going to look from this day forward. Yeah. Yeah. How it's going to look, look at Mama's birthday party? How it's going to look? Now, there's some families I do know that went through something like this, and they put up safeguards. They called me, and I, and I said, "If you, I get it. That's the brother. You love him just as much you love the daughter. I get it. And you, you know, you kind of, I really kind of go to Mama's house, and you know your brother's going to be there, but you know your daughter, you know this kind of stuff. Like that. I'm not only concerned about your daughter because now you've been told." But what about the other nieces and nephews that your, your brother is exposed to? So yes. do I do diligence? A conversation needs to be happening. There's a conversation to happen. And we gotta be willing, and this is and I, I hate to say it this way, we gotta be willing to lose that person to save another person. Do that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. You know, and I think a lot of things are done out of ignorance, you know. You know, I know I was faced with a situation. I, I'm saying for me, I was faced with a situation years ago and um similar to, you know, a touch field type thing. And you know, it was exposed, but I didn't understand the dynamics. Me, I'm saying Grace, didn't understand the right. dynamics that those people shouldn't even be in the same room ever again, you know. And again, it wasn't until I went to hear me now and I heard the discussion, and that was years ago. I couldn't go back for you, but you know, I didn't understand the plight of that victim. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then, and keep in mind is this is so big because every situation is different. Every answer does not ha ha um, solve every problem, but right. you, have to, you have to have you have to have an assessment in place so you can determine what is the solution the key thing is there's a conversation need to happen there's training need to happen if we have this ongoing throughout our churches throughout our program throughout our youth yeah. program, throughout women's program we constantly put it in the face how can we not have solutions the problem yeah, right. is not right. in our face enough it's not in our face it's only in our face when it comes to the national holiday or when a child gets snatched, or when we find out a pastor did something, or we find out the youth program, a youth worker did something. Um, there's certain things I tell, tell um, pastors how to safeguard your church. You got to safeguard your church. So you may, you may have parents that are off the wall and they're two people are doing something. But if you have safe walls in your church, maybe in other words, is don't let those workers have closed doors conversation with children. Have an open door policy. Have yeah. have don't have yeah. the to be have glass and um wooden whatever you need to do. Make sure that's two parents or two um uh, adult chaperones. Make sure that if you're taking children home, they sit in the back seat and you you don't have nobody in the front seat. Make sure you have a cell phone on while the whole com the whole time you're driving this child home. So therefore, nothing can be said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Pastor Bird, yeah. Yes, I, I saw where 
um, there was a, a suggestion for youth leaders or Sunday school classes, teachers, never ever take a child in a one-on-one. -on -one. That parent has to remain until they're two adults, so it's always a check and a balance. What I did, I put a, a monitor, I put a TV, a camera, and where the youth are. So every area of my church is under surveillance. I can sit in my office and see every area to make sure what's going on during church. Absolutely. I totally agree. Now, not only with the cameras, because if churches are not able to, or programs are not able to install for, um, uh, cameras, just other things that you can do to ensure that an adult is not taking a child to a, a secluded area. Um, or, you know, a child wants to talk to an adult because I do believe children want to talk to an adult by themselves. That's no problem. But how do you safeguard that? How you how you safeguard the, the, the worker and the child? Okay, open door policy. Okay, this is the check in, check out list. Hey, uh, no parent, I mean, no adult should be coming to the front and you don't know that they have a youth program going on. You don't know. I tell my first, I say, listen, don't be impacting my young people. You impact the them. Don't be having private conversations with young people. Like what I said, we have um, a policy. We have policy and procedures, and of course, I implement safe wall in our church. So therefore, we don't have this type of church. If I see men that kind of like little flirty with the girl, oh, I put the dogs on them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm watching. I'm playing, and I'm watching you. <laughs> Watch and pray. <laughs> My I'm eyes are closed. I train my intercessor. I train my intercessor to know how to pray with your eyes wide open. I don't, don't close your eyes. I put people on the door. Because like, you know when the spirit get high, the people start moving. Uh, uh huh. Okay. Start moving. Mm -hmm. And then the children start exiting out. And then the older kids start exiting out. I'd I be up there praying. I could be up there praying. I say, go check. Right. Okay. Awesome. Right. I don't want to see a child hurt on my watch. Right, right. Because I know what it does. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I know what it does to a person when they've been abused sexually. It messed their life up. And yeah. pastor, yes, for an for for um a leader to have to deal with the scandal of a lie because they were not they weren't safeguarded. And I had it where there was a I'm a licensed daycare provider. There was a young girl that went through the elementary school. She got six girls and she told them, she said, I need you to go to the principal and tell the principal that you were raped by this teacher. These are African-American girls and a Caucasian teacher. She said, she told the girls, she, she tutored them very well. She said, you have to cry hard and you have to be dramatic so they'll believe you. Now, the teacher, I spoke directly to the teacher. He said to me, he said, Mrs. Anderson, I almost lost everything I, I've worked for. My wife, my children, and my degree. He said, I vowed to myself. He said, and so the girls, if they felt bad. And they went to the principal a couple of days later. And they said, we all lied. So and so told us to come in and do this. All right. He said to me, he said, Mrs. Anderson, I would never ever have my be in a classroom one on one. I will never teach with my door shut ever. He yeah. said, This my whole life, my education, everything, my children, my wife, everything was almost taken away from me based on a lie. On a lie. But let me tell you something. What about children? And this is something I just learned to be in the system that they can't keep a lie up. <laughs> Their story is going to change. If there's a lie out there, believe me, they're going to get caught mm -hmm. because they can't keep a lie up. We adults can keep a lie up. Some of us. I know I could. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. Girl, I was a good liar. Woo! What? I, I was lying so bad. So I believe my own lies, child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get that. I'm not going to get in that testimony. But my point is, children. Children can't not keep a pattern up like that. The younger they are, the worse it is. Even teenagers, they just get lost in it. And sometimes, of course, I hate to, I hate to hear that happen because there's so many children are getting abused. And when you got to investigate, yeah, real yeah. deep investigation. I want to.
Go ahead. I, know, I want to ask something else. I know the hour is growing late, but you know, I, I would love because because of your situation, you have dealt with personally these experiences. Um, and, you know, I, I just believe that there's a lot of people that if they're not listening now, they'll be listening in the future. Um, and they're still dealing with the hate, the hurt of the past. Can you speak somewhat of um, how to overcome the pain? You know, if I don't have the opportunity to look to my uh, the person that did this to me and for them to apologize, you know, how can I heal? You know, how can I heal and move past? Can you give us some suggestions or ideas to give these people some release um, in moving forward? Well, the first and foremost thing is um, I believe that every person should get counseling. Counseling. Now, I didn't get counseling. Um, I had to go through my ordeal and I had to go through my practice of healing. Um, this was me and God. Uh, you know, and I thank God for it now, but during the time, I wanted to get to somebody who, you know, help me naturally do it. Uh, first and foremost, you go to counseling. I mean, you can't, there's nothing wrong with counseling. Church people can go to counseling. You know what I mean? There's something. Absolutely. There's right. something that you need to help somebody that's licensed and can, I'm not talking about you know crazy stuff, I'm just talking about license that can help you navigate through this. And the second yeah. thing is, the second thing is, don't allow this is something that God had did with me on. Um, because it was so people in my family that wrote me. There was so many people that should have been supervised me, but they were taking advantage of the vulnerability. Um, I've been raped by gun, gun porn, I was raped by knife porn. Um, so one, one of the person left me in the portal blood. The actual first time I got raped, I was five years old. I was left in my blood, and my brother was the one that saved me. Um, and but here's my thing. One thing that I had go through the step is one. I realized that as long as I allow the very thing that was designed to kill me back then, probably mm -hmm. for my future and my present, I was given that circumstances too much power. Yes. I was giving it too much power. Now watch this. When you forgive and allow you to heal those wounds, it does not neglect that it did it did happen. That's not what it does. A lot of times people don't they hold on unforgiveness because it seems like it wipes out what this person did to you. No, it doesn't wipe it out. No. But what happened is that thing was designed to kill you. And now you allow it to rob you now. So now what we have to turn that all that energy and say, you know what? You know, you hurt me, and I had to look. I'm being honest with you. Those people were in my family, and I still look at the people today. And the only reason why I'm not going to no detail because we lied. Amen. Praise God. I, I'm <laughs> lying. <laughs> Pastor Teresa. Yes. I want to tell you that we're so honored to have you on the platform today, and we're, we know without a doubt that lives have changed. But I want to ask you a question, or maybe you can give us um, someone that may be watching us today that may be a victim, and they're dealing with it, especially now that's shelter and stay, people are home because of the pandemic, and um, they have to deal with the father, the mother, the sister, the, the family member that is steady, maybe molested them or raping them. Is there any tip that you can give that young girl, that young boy, or that mother, that father, what they can do to alleviate. Go tell. You, you know, you're gonna hurt yourself and hurt your family more. In this is a secret. It's not your fault. Tell. tell who? Tell what? Tell. Tell someone. Tell someone that you can trust. If you had to tell a, uh, a neighbor, if you had to tell your grandmother. Now watch this. And I hate to say this. <clears throat> because all dynamics are different. Everybody's dynamics are different. Because sometimes I have learned in my the system I work in that when they go tell the grandmother, the grandmother, you know, we, we, we young grandmothers, but the older grandmother, they like, well, baby, you're going to pray about it. Well, so, I'm a grandmother. I ain't praying about nothing. I'm, I'm going to <laughs> pray for you. I'm going to pray for the person. But we're going to do something about this. So my, yeah. my tip would be is go tell someone. If you have to tell a neighbor, go tell a neighbor. If you have to go tell the Sunday school teacher, tell the Sunday school teacher. If you have to, if you have to grow in the grocery store, I, I had someone, this store, I had someone in the grocery store came straight up to me. I must have got it on my forehead that I, I had worked for the state. I promise you. They came straight to me and said, I'm being abused. I'm being mm -hmm. abused. And, you know, and I was at the right place at the right time. And I did something about it. I called JSO. 
I said, okay, baby. I took that child by the hand. She was a young person. She was 10 years old. I took her by the hand, we went straight to the front, got on my cell phone. I said, and the, the, the auntie, she was with her auntie. And, she, and it wasn't the auntie who did it to her, but I wasn't playing the game. I said, no, I'm so sorry. I work for the state. I'm so sorry. I'm not really from the child until JSO comes. So my, my question would be is, that child, if it's a teenager, if it's a, if it's a child, if it's a cell phone one, because it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. And then not only that, we, um, unfortunately, I hate to say this, because children don't know how to protect themselves. Now, mm -hmm. I do provide a training for young kids, but most of my training for the youth, that's a little bit different. My my um, my um advice to young people is a little bit different than to the young people, to the, to the younger generation. Teenagers, because the age difference is different, and because they, have, they can understand and they know how to articulate what's going on with them, Sometimes the younger they are, the more difficult it is for them to articulate what's going on with them and who touch them. Um, so if you if we have a person that's out there now and you experience it, or you may be an adult and you know a teenager, a young person that could be possibly been experienced uh, in this, go tell someone. Be that child hero. Be that child hero. Love that. Be yeah, that child hero. Yes, I wanted yes. somebody to be my savior, but they was not my Come savior. On. Come on. I wanted somebody to snatch me out of the situation I was in, but they didn't do it. But and so I made a promise to myself that there's no way if I even if I look at a situation. Now, of course, you know, when you've been abused or you know about this stuff, you can be paranoid at times. But I'm not talking about when you've been paranoid. You know the difference when you've been paranoid and when you really see what you see. If you see an older man playing with young girls, let's talk about can you still be still repeated from fine when you see an adult that's inappropriate with a child a lot of times adults when they're inappropriate with a child they have no boundaries with children they play with them they have more relationship with young people than they have with adult people mm -hmm. so that's one of the indicators that you may be dealing with someone they have a there's a possibility that they're abusing children because they have inappropriate relationships with younger kids they don't get along with adults but they get along with young people Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, you're right. you're right. You're right. I mean, they they friends. They said, "Well, that's my friend." How can somebody a fourteen year old be your friend? They can even have a dialogue conversation with you. Yeah, they don't have no friends outside of what they do. There's something wrong with that. The next one is they engage in they touchy feely. I don't know if you ever seen ducks. They just dug touchy feely. Why are you always touching on young people? Get your hands off that children. But that same sign is also for the children. Children are touchy feely. When you when you have a child that's just over touchy feely, let's talk about with that. Okay. Um, the other one is <clears throat> they love to talk about personal personal relationship with a child. That's inappropriate. They're showing mm -hmm. options. I had cases where adult men, adult women, not only adult men, but women too, they were literally showing children inappropriate pictures. So that's called the grooming process. They groom them. That's called the grooming process. They didn't go at it right away. They started talking about their personal life, and then they start showing them pictures. Well, I had one case where a guy he called himself accidentally showing. You know, he didn't know his phone was up. That's what he said. But it was called the grooming process. He was grooming that young girl. He was grooming her. The next thing is, um, these signs you know, sign when an adult to be a positive predator. You have situation predators, meaning is this person does not have a thing for kids, but if their situation to present itself, they will harm a child. We have more situational predators than we have sexual predators. Because if the situation presents itself, situation predators don't even get caught. They don't get caught. Sexual predators, they end up getting caught. But situation predators, because situation don't always present itself. And what is the situation? Situation is when that child come in the room and they didn't know it was coming. Mm. That's the situation. That means the situation presents itself. Um, versus mm. this person looking for a child. That's a different when you're a sexual predator. You look for a child to abuse. Where versus this child comes to you in the form of a situation. Oh, uncle, can you take me home? Sure, baby. And he, now this is her fault, but she got a short skirt on, and he's like, oh. Okay. Situation. Wow. He would not actually go follow. He would not never kind of go after her, but.
But if the situation presents itself, he will or she will. The last thing is they spend money without the parent approval. When you have a adult spending money on your child and you are not aware of it, that's grooming. They're grooming the child. That happens a lot with our teenagers. This happened with the teenager more than anybody. Because especially teenage, teenage, teenage girls, they like to get their nails done, get their hair done. And so these older men and women, now we get a, we have an um, increase in women now, unfortunately. We have a very big increase in women now approaching. You won't believe this. We have an increase in past, female pastors molesting girls. I, I've heard of that. Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. it has increased. Oh, my. Yeah. Now they have the junior armor bears. Yeah. The junior interceptors. Watch out. And they're, they're grooming them. They're being their mother figure. And guess what? They can groom them for two years. I have a case where this lady groomed this girl for two years. Check them text messages. Text message, you know what? And then you you, know, you, you have to check the text mes messages. And then you have to text your leaders. Pastors, if you're out there, you need to have conversations with your leaders. Okay. If they over the youth ministry, they don't need to have a private conversation that you do not know about. You, you, as a leader, as a pastor, we have a responsibility as well. Children church ministry. What type of conversation are we having with the, those children? We have a responsibility as well. And a, 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 the last one is when you find adults that spend a lot of time with children. They spend more time with other people's children than they spend with their own. That's mm -hmm. one of the cases. That's one of the indicators. So they're not gonna mess with their own children. They'll mess with somebody else's kids. Can I, Pastor yes. Teresa? It, yes. It's important. We have pastors that's watching. As a pastor, how do you deal? What would you say to a pastor if a person that is being accused is a ace bone cone ride or die? How do you? How do you help the pastor, even if it's not their friend? They're just a minister in their church. They're a leader. How, what, what is the role of us as pastors in this situation? How do we break free and minister to the, how do we, how do you know? You just don't know. This is my friend. I know him. this is a child. What do you say? What, what, what's your suggestion? Well, my suggestion is every church need to have a prevention program. When stuff comes like this, especially with the staff, friends, colleagues, other pastors, if it's a youth program, if that prevention program is in place, when the allegation has been made, it goes through that process. It's out the pastor's hand. I love it. It's out the pastor's hand. I can't deal with it because we got a, we got a system. That's how we deal with it. I don't touch that. The other thing is, if the pastor is not the person that they go to, guess what? The pastor is not the one they're going to call to court. So my prevention program, if it's implemented correctly, if it's implemented correctly, the pastor is never in a position where they got to choose sides. Because if it goes through the program, if it goes through a prevention program, the system, the system handles all the allegations, not the pastor. So right. these things right. should be in your bylaws. The chain of command. It should be well, in your in your bylaws, it should state that the in the bylaws it should state that we have a provincial program that addresses all allegations. That's all we gotta say. My God. And then you just make sure, make sure that the process, the policy is written out. So if something was to happen, a long time happened, you go back to your bylaws where it points to your program. This is how we handle it. The problem is the pastor got the, the pastor got to keep the word that they're gonna stay out of it. But the pastor should be knowledgeable about it. Okay, so watch this. I, I don't want to go through a training right now, but I'm gonna give you this part, part. A part of the prevention program, there's a report system. The report, a, a, a written report, is given to the pastor so they're aware of the situation. Okay, good. One I want to make call. Sure. Yeah. One phone call. That pastor said, I'm aware of the situation. I'm, I'm thank God for the prevent, prevention team. They're going to handle all allegations. I'm praying for you and I'm praying for you. You back up out of it. That person tried to come to you, Pastor. I'm sorry. We have protocols, we have procedures. That's what you got to go through. And you still out of it. 
Awesome, awesome, awesome. This was just awesome. I, I learned so much today and I'm definitely going to be contacting you personally so we can set up myself at our church, a program. I think I think churches everywhere. I think not just churches. I think individuals need programs set up, you know. I think if you don't have any kids at all, you need to get a program so when you get a kid, you know what you need to do, you know. Yeah. You, know, you, know, you know what I did? I started putting um added people to look at it that don't have children yet and then i added people that do it we you need to know if you're getting ready to have children this is what you need not only that i um mm -hmm. I, did, I did today i did two board trainings today and i teach my boys this I, you know when i start because i'm a part um a non-profit specialist as well i'm a Jamaican child listen you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. On a serious note, I tell my nonprofit organization, when you, you're going to create programs that's going to house children or going to serve children, you want to start in the beginning and making sure you're implementing these programs. Because you want to get volunteers, you have staff, and they're going to work. And these are not church. This is not These people are not church. These are people, these people that see the problem in the community. And they, they they got an answer to the problem, and they want to um, create a program. So I, I tell them, I give them my straight up testimony. I tell them about the other part of my business. I say, you know, I can do this for a little bit enough money for you because all my policy now here is all pastors listen. All policy is already written. All you gotta do is call me. Oh, with that said, with that said, we do have people already asking for your information. Can you give them your information? We will send it to them later on, but give them your information so they know how to contact you. Yes, all you have to do is go to my website, website Teresa Burton, uh, Teresa, Pastor Teresa B dot com or Teresa Burton Ministry dot com. You can go to either one of those websites and it will lead direct to my safe, um, safe wall initiative. If you put the information in, I'll give you my assistant. I do have a team. Um, because when we come into church, we do train everybody. One thing my training does, we train the staff, we train the volunteers, and we train the pastor. Now, although the pastor is going to be a part of the training, I'm training the pastor so they need to know what's going to happen when they go through that prevention program. So they do need to know the procedure. They, it's not like they're supposed to be blind and don't supposed to know anything. No, you need to know what's going on in your church. But the, the, the question is, it protects the pastor. It protects the pastor. It protects the so watch watch this. Not only that procedure is for the pastor, it's also for the youth workers as well. Mm -hmm. Once something has been reported to you, you call your team. Okay, we got an allegation, we need to come to the church. That team come up there and they they put, take the paperwork and follow the line and they make the proper phone call. Okay, awesome. Okay, so someone asked again, is Pastor Teresa B. Okay, and that's T E R E S, right? Yeah. Because you know, some, some you spell Teresa different ways. Dot yeah. com. Dot com. Dot com. And we'll also we'll forward the information. But again, we thank you. We appreciate you. People you. are asking for segment two. We definitely gotta have that's you back cool. again. Your wealth of information. Not only does yeah. she deal with child abuse, she also deal with domestic violence, yeah. and that's another thing that we have been pushing under the table for years. Yeah. And we want to expose it. We want to talk about sister. it. Huh? I want to be a soul sister. <laughs> you are so sister. Come on, you let us know. Come on, come on, come on now. Don't you wanna go? You are a soul sister. And, and we want to give a shout out also to Heal Me Now. When is Heal Me Now coming out, Pastor yes. C? July thirty yes. first through August the second. We're going to be virtual. Okay. We have. Pastor Ruby Holland Hutchins. We have Pastor Christina Staten. We have Woo! Pastor Teresa Burton. We have Lady yeah. Grace. We have Flossie. We have Pastor Barbara Jackson. We have Apostle Matthew Tillery. We have Evangelist Sandra Jackson. And I'm missing one more. Pastor we have Man. Pastor Jeffrey Mann. That's my brother, y'all. That's my brother. That's my brother. So we have a plethora of speakers. We have a Providence TJ Jackson. And so we are working really gently to bring you this virtual. And I know it's going to bless your socks off. Registration will begin in a couple of days. 
It is the $50 registration. You're going to be to come into the prayer room. You're going to be to come into facilitators. It is going to be dynamic. You don't want to miss it. Pastor Teresa Burton is going to be to go there and bless you. I have a story that I am a survivor and God gave me Heal Me Now Retreat. We have birthed out songs, our Heal Me Now songs. We have yes, yes. so many. Listen, Heal Me, Jesus. <laughs> You sit here, came desperate for a touch. Yes, presence and fill me with your love. You're my bomb and Gilead. Pain, you stay alive. Suicide. Brain. So I want you to be yeah, with us. Yeah, oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. Like that. I'm gonna know how to sing like that one day. <laughs> <laughs> we make a joyful noise. I, I, I just barely make it. <laughs> but, but not only is it a retreat for women, it's a retreat for men. It is a yeah. retreat for children. Minister Latricia, Sister Katrina, Minister Ruiz, they have their a whole plethora. You want your children to get off of TikTok? You want your children to get off of stuff that don't matter? <laughs> Get them to heal me now. Yeah. Yes. Listen, yes. today I was in my van. My grandbabies was not singing secular music. They were singing church songs, and I love it. And my granddaughter said, Nana, I want to try to cry. She's only eight years old. One of them said, Nana, I'm going to play the saxophone. I said, I'm going to buy it for you. And the other one said, Nana, will you buy me a guitar? Yes, I will. You know why? Anything that they do for Christ, for church, right. I'm yeah. all, whatever it takes, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, whatever it takes, whatever it takes, so heal me now, right, so sisters. <laughs> heal me now, heal me now, heal me, Jesus, heal, heal me, heal me, heal me now. July 31st through August the second, be there. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, we thank you, sisters. We appreciate you. We appreciate our audience. We appreciate you sharing. We appreciate the love. We appreciate Pastor Burton coming on and sharing with us. She's coming back. She's a sister. She's going to have a seat at the table. She's awesome. Okay. You see, she's funny and hilarious and she's crazy just like the rest of us. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait, you. Wait, you crazy? Oh, yeah. I got it. I forgot I'm not the I forgot about that part. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. We love you. Hey, sisters. Is somebody saying give us a call? Okay. Uh, Lady we appreciate Grace, you. We love so you. Okay. Lady Grace, can I say this real quick? It would be robbery if I didn't. I met Pastor Teresa Burton through Pastor Bob. Sure did. And it would be robbery for me, whatever, to, to not say <laughs> <laughs> did not say. I found oh, wow, out. I didn't know that. I didn't know yeah. that. I met, I, met her. I met her from Pastor Reed. Can I share okay. something about Pastor Barbara? Yeah. Let, me tell you, let me tell you what Pastor Barbara did to me. <laughs> I yeah. thought I was preaching. She stood there, she sat in this chair and just sat there. You, you're crazy. <laughs> I'll be crazy. I never, I never had nobody tell me I was crazy in my face. You know, I have to. <laughs> but no, she said, I like all of that. All of that. All of that. All of what? All of that. Yes. yes. <laughs> listen, I'm going to go special. I tell people, I, I warn people, I say, listen, let me give you some disclaimers. I'm not rap too tight up here. Okay, that's all that. <laughs> I'm special too. I'm special too. I'm going to have daughters at our church. Faithful members of our church. Thank you, Pastor Teresa. God yeah. bless you. Thank you for I know we're late, but Pastor Teresa, the thing is, when you come in, you're impactful, you're influential, and we see the, the evidence. So when you bring her to your church, you will see evidence yes. of what's 
she's printing in that it sets a mark and it's working. Yeah, it worked. Yeah. Tell me now, she, you've been there three years. Yeah, Good stuff. and you'll be yeah. back. Amen. 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 Your kids won't leave me alone. I'm like, I'm not. Oh, they call me auntie. Amen. Yes, you Amen. are. <laughs> and Pastor Christina, I love you. I love your I love your person. I love all y'all. I know. Is it flawed? Flossy. 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 That's Grace's cousin. That's who? Dr. Grace's cousin. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. She will pray the walls down and prophesy you a new, 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 new <laughs> Oh, yeah. Power. Power. Just to keep me in prayer because you know. <laughs> okay, we thank you for signing on to us. We are going to sign off now. We love and appreciate you. I think, I think, you know, I, I think I, I'm putting you on the spot here. But Pastor Teresa, can you just give us a prayer? You know, you know, minister, you have ministered. Uh, your, your words have been so edifying and lifting yeah. up. Just could you just, you know, just give us a, a short word of prayer and, and as a dismissal, please. Prayer. You ask a preacher to do a short prayer. Pray yeah. God. Do you? Do you? Do you? I'm a, I'm a deliverer minister and you, you asked me to do a short prayer <laughs> I felt the power of the Holy Ghost okay let's pray Father God we thank you we thank you for your power we thank you for your wisdom we thank you right now for open avenues God that we can be able to minister to your people about sensitive um subjects God Father mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus every person that's on this line for every person that's under the sound of our voice God heal their heart God, actually, right now, they're let them present their past and present their failures, present their wounds and hurt. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that you heal them. If you did it for me, you could do it for them. Now, Father God, I pray for people that may be suffering in silence, God. I pray right now, God, a Deborah will rise up. I pray a Moses would rise up. I pray a Joshua will rise up and speak on the behalf of the person that's in silent, God. God, I thank you right now, God, you healing our land in the name of Jesus, God. You said in your word, by your stripes, we are healed, and I speak healing on, in the land today, God. Heal yes, every thank you, Lord. Little, every little boy. Heal every adult man that suffer in silence, yes. God. There's some, there is some prejudice out there don't want to be the way they are, but because they're sexual bound, God, we pray right now in the name of oh Jesus. God. Bomb and Gilead, your bomb and Gilead will heal them right now in the name of Jesus. Heal them now in yes, the name God. of Jesus, God. Because every predator in the name of Jesus, every sexual predator in the name of Jesus, God. Yes, we thank you right now for what you're going to do in this season as you yes. open the gate, God, that we can bring healing in the land. We thank you right now that you're raising us up to be Peter, that our shadow will heal the people in the name of Jesus. We thank you for God. Thank you for this platform. Touch these ladies, God, as it continue on. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 Good night. Good night. Good night. Goodbye. Uh. <laughs>